I, Kim Oliver, a black six foot one disabled wheelchair using goddess with a rare disease was invited to speak at TEDx Accra because my perspective, my wisdom, my experience was seen as having value. I'm here as an authority. Feel free to Google me. However, I and millions of people around the world who look like me, who look like Jamal Kerr, my co-founder, are yet to have this experience. They are yet to hear their own voices. They are yet to see themselves represented anywhere or centered in any conversation or space. Let's clear one thing up first. Disability is literally an environmental or genetic lottery. It can happen to anyone of any age, class, sex, sexuality, gender, religion, or political affiliation or skin complexion. It's not an inherent moral flaw. It does not negate one's humanity. It does not require overcoming or hiding. And it is not there to provide you with inspiration. On that point, disabled people make up at least 20% of any population. Yet we are erased from our environments and history often without question. Upwards of five million folks here in Ghana are disabled. Poverty and lack of access to good medical care are major contributors to the numbers. However, due to taboo and social stigma, lack of up-to-date recording and reporting, the number is likely much higher. Can a world where such a large portion of the population are maligned in ways that are often fatal, call itself civilized or enlightened? I ask again, can an Africa where the key vulnerable part of the community, where our disabled parents, siblings, and cousins are dehumanized and face the highest rates of poverty, abuse, and death, call itself civilized, enlightened, or even African? We all know that who is seen, represented, and remembered is who will be catered for, listened to, welcome, and seen as having value. That is one of the reasons we created the Triple Cripples, to redress the imbalance of value within our society through the powerful tool of representation. We want to create an equitable society for us and the generations to come. It is erroneous to believe that a space which centers folks in the margins, so black, disabled, women, femmes, non-binary folks, and trans folks, will automatically exclude anyone else. The issues of folks in the margins of the margins are planetary issues. As we the Triple Cripples always say, when you center those within the margins of the margins, everybody benefits. Being focused on the margins is not being exclusionary. It rather helps to form a framework for creating a society where holistic inclusion and non-tokenistic diversity are at the center. So nobody falls through the gaps. It's safe to say that I'm the only active, highly visible, femme-presenting wheelchair user in Accra. I wish I could say that my visibility will hold this government and all African governments to account. I wish that my presence demanded that when they say come home or year of return, they prove that they truly mean all of us. I mean it won't. They don't even want the ones born here. They hardly want disabled imports, right? Common retorts to me bringing up the topic of integrating disability into the social consciousness include, you're not in the West, this is Africa. How insulting. Uncles and Krumah, Lumumba and Sankara must turn in their graves every time people talk about their ancient beloved continent like it has no rich past and no hopeful future. Africans, after all, are who civilized and educated the West or at least try to. Sometimes our perception of the possibility of a great black future is tainted by the disregard for a millennia's worth of hoarding of our intellect and our resources by the West, who have subsequently presented their gains as their own in history books, in media, in film. Something else I hear is, if you give up, you'll be just like the useless beggars on the street. Incidentally, the disdain for the poorest people is one of the detestable leftovers of colonial capitalist white supremacist patriarchal conditioning. And often, miraculously, not, the poorest folks just so happen to be disabled. Coincidence? I think not.
A review of the research places disabled Ghanaians firmly at the bottom of the societal hierarchy with the most heinous and disturbing outcomes. Most of us cannot access education, inaccessible schools, classrooms, colonial content, societal stigma and attitudes from both staff and students all form barriers for disabled Africans accessing education. Most of our experiences of relationships are just disheartening. From parent-child to intimate relationships, our experiences and our outcomes are marred by the heavy weight of societal stigma and erasure. Physical, psychological, emotional and sexual abuse rates for disabled people are high, especially for disabled women and children. Erasure of disabled women from the societal landscape makes them easy victims and allows perpetrators free reign to terrorize in perpetuity with impunity. By the way, the erasure of disabled women from the Ghanaian landscape is a clear sign of sexism. But this is a TEDx talk, not a course. So, you know, if you want to learn more, you know, pay me. I'm an expert. That's why I'm here. Most disabled Ghanaians cannot access skills, training or employment. Employers won't even take applications from disabled people. People write us off before we even open our mouths to speak or sign. Don't believe me? Check out this interaction between me and a Ghanaian skills training provider. You see, even I, a disabled diasporan, am desperate to try and make ends meet here in Ghana. So much so that I did what all the taxi drivers claim the disabled beggars don't do. I tried to go and learn a skill or trade. As you can see, I can't even access the training due to the immediate barrier of not being able to get into the building. Second is their lack of flexibility or innovative approach to teaching. And third and probably most important is the price of the training itself. Access to healthcare unsurprisingly, is another barrier for us. You see, when a system requires that you utilize money to access medical attention of any kind, the presumption is that you will have access to some means of acquiring money. And based on previous examples, we should all now see how that system actively excludes the most vulnerable people in this society. But not only that, Studies show that attitudes towards disabled folks from staff is reflective of the general animosity and lack of understanding that exists within the society at large. Apparently, medical school cannot cure colonial pseudoscientific bigotry. For most disabled Africans, it is a never-ending loop of poverty and fatality caused by socio-cultural exclusion and stigma, as well as the societal structures which remain non-existent. You might have noticed me include myself in the demographics. Well, I'd like you to understand clearly that there is no difference between me and the disabled people you pretend not to see or actively abuse at the traffic lights. Our humanity is parallel. And if you want to separate me from them, as that feels more comfortable and better suits your sensibilities, I invite you to interrogate the respectability politics and colonized bigotry you are afflicted with. I, Dr. Kim, recommend a consistent dose of introspection and a lifetime of decolonization as a sure remedy. To reiterate what I said in a video I wrote and edited for Erica Hart's Black History series, yes, I'm a multi-talented Bay of Goddess, a catch. All black is not the same here. Certain passports, currencies, and accents hold undeniable power. But when we throw disability into the mix, the narrative morphs. Yes, disdain and animosity towards disabled people is global. Colonization was global. But perhaps it feels more pronounced here because I want to feel at home somewhere. I too want to experience the Pan-African future that Miriam Makiba, Aikwe Ama, Falakuti, Franklin and Faustina Oliver, Dr. Albertine Ngoyi and Kwame Ture envision through their work, an African utopia. But disabled black folks on the continent and in the diaspora are often left out of conversations about Pan-Africanist futures and repatriation. There are, you see, no disabled people in Wakanda. Religion plays a huge role in attitudes towards disability as well as queerness. 
The discourse surrounding both is often abysmal, dehumanizing, and downright chilling, often linked to evil, demonic activity, curses, and white influence, erroneously. This wreaks havoc in a society and directly impacts the psychological, emotional, and spiritual and physical safety of disabled folks, as is evidenced from the outcomes we discussed before. You see, colonizer religions teach us not just to fear the black consciousness, but to fear its variety of iterations. I am but one of its beautiful iterations. You see, everything has a root, but let me not shake any more tables. Again, pay black women for their expertise. On a personal note, I am grossly aware of my positioning, not just from the inaccessibility of the city and its homes, but from the taxi drivers that don't want to carry me in their cars, the shopkeepers that refuse to look me in the eye, the groups of people that pull out their phones to film me when I'm out in public, the comments of open pity, the fear of touching me, the open assertions that they don't wanna see me in a wheelchair, the prayers, the open rudeness not afforded to able-bodied diasporans who are often shown deference, the men that treat you like a grateful hostage, the unprecedented extortion. I am completely reliant on the goodwill, the pity and or moral obligation of strangers who may or may not see me as woman, as human, as whole. This is not what I signed up for. I signed up for anonymity. I signed up for ease, for welcome, for home. But this isn't about me. It's about everyone who looks like me, who exists across the spectrum of disability in my skin. Those who are hidden and erased from existence. It has to be bigger than just one individual. But if we are going to use me as a template for the macro, I am a disabled black woman. You have no idea what it is like to live in this patriarchal ableist, racist world without a single place to call home, even within your own family, community, or nation. Surrounded by non-disabled people and structures that actively exclude you, and even with the best of intentions, make it woefully known that you are unwelcome, that your life is not equal, that your entire being is a flaw, that you are easily disposable. Don't tell me to smile. Give me something to smile about. Don't tell me to be strong. Be my supporter. Don't tell me to try harder. Create avenues for me to flourish. Don't tell me how sad you are for me. Make the environment one that caters for whatever needs that I might have so that I have an equitable experience alongside you. This can be an Africa that leads the world in understanding the depth and breadth of humanity, leading with structural and cultural compassion, building on the premise of ensuring that its most vulnerable constituents experience safety, equity, and that they thrive. I don't want an ideological home. I want a physical community, societal structure, and culture in which I can feel like an equal player in the game of life. And you know what? We should all be creating it, especially white people and everyone else who has benefited off of black nations, our land, sea, multiple types of human resource and labor. We created the Triple Cripples to make room in our collective consciousness for a future that included all of us, with those in the margins of the margins at the center. Being visible, being represented, is only part of that journey. This Africa is within our grasp. We are not truly free until all of us are free. Until we embed that into our thinking, we will keep having this same conversation for the next hundred years. And instead of Kwame Nkrumah, I, Kim Oliver, will be rolling around in my grave wondering why my children are wasting time and not sitting at the table that I laid before them. Onyaso.